When I was pretty young, I must have been 13 or something, I remember finding the first journal publication of a solid 3D object rendered by a computer in, in some article in the New Mexico State University library. And I checked it out and I was so excited that I was running down the street outside the library stopping strangers to make them look at it like an idiot. But I just used to be so filled with enthusiasm that I couldn't help but just like show things to random people. So I remember that. And I also remember in that same library, I would say the New Mexico State University Library was my first sort of major library experience. And I, uh, I remember sort of coming through in the weird back corners, there'd be like collections of strange art journals and stuff like that. They, was, they, were, they were just uh, terribly alien. And uh, you know what's funny is when I think back on that, I have to say, I'm not sure that degree of kind of romantic uncovering of weird things has ever quite been matched by my experiences online, although some of those have been really good too. Well, you know, the library budget cut is just one little tiny fractal piece of the much larger story that uh, of, of the rise of income inequality. The centers of wealth tend to be around the biggest computers these days. They, they tend to gather where people are gathering and analyzing data about other people. Right now the library is the last place you can seek information without being spied on. And uh, there's, there's really none other left. Well, you know, the funny, th a funny things happen because of the rise of big computers, because in the old days, the most important issue was probably censorship and whether information was made available. And pr probably right now, the even more important issue is uh, whether spying information about people is being gathered based on what they read, what they're interested in, what they look at. And uh, that creates an imbalance of power that's even worse than being able to censor what information people have access to. So. Given that, suddenly there's this allegiance between people who are gathering spy information about people and, and uh, being anti-censorship and, and open access. Because of course, the more information people can have access to and the more openly and easily they can, the easier it is to gather spy data about what information they access. So it's no longer enough to say, well, I'm against censorship and I'm for open access. Because if the way people have access to information is creating an even worse inequity than denial of information used to, then we're not really getting anywhere. In fact, we might be back, we might be uh, backpedaling. So we have to be very careful. OK, well, the book's called Who Owns the Future? Uh, it's proposing a, um, a way of understanding how computation interacts with uh, the economy and with society. It proposes that there have been some surprising effects that tend to increase uh, income inequality and do damage to the middle classes, um, or whatever term you prefer for that, people who are in, 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 the, in the middle block of society. And that in turn <clears throat> does damage both to capitalism and society and, and markets. Um, and it proposes at least a, a, a first sketch at alternatives uh, for thinking about how networks can inter interface with all of that. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated book that acts on, on, on a lot of levels. And I can imagine it might be a frustrating book in that it doesn't provide all the answers, but I don't have all the answers yet. I mean, I'm saying yet because I believe that we will find answers. I'm, I'm quite confident of that. I'm, I'm very much an optimist.